If you've ever thought about growing hops and you've done a preliminary internet search, you'll see very quickly that they're kind of a, a big animal and they require a lot of space. You'll see them growing up trellises or up poles or in my case in Montana, I have them growing up uh, chicken wire on a pole on a fence side. And that can be kind of intimidating if you're not necessarily permanent or you live in an apartment and you just don't want to commit to laying something down in your land. So the purpose of this video is to show you how to kind of get away with um, growing them in a mobile solution. This is a sub-irrigated planter and this is what I'll show you how to build. What is a sub-irrigated planter or SIP for short? It's basically a kind of a build that you do and water circumvents the grow medium, collects in a reservoir underneath and through capillary action the water wicks its way up and the plants meet it in the middle. Uh, two of the big big advantages of this are versus traditional soil watering you lose a lot via evaporation. And since the water goes underneath the grow medium and isn't subjected to evaporation, you'll use about 90% less, and as well as control. So for example, in Montana, we have very rocky soil and it's not necessarily conducive to growing a lot of things. Since you're setting up an environment, uh, in this case, 75 liters or 20 gallons, you're setting up the perfect environment for these vegetables or these hops to grow. Also, quite portable. 75 liters or 20 gallons uh, with the medium that I use, it's probably in the vicinity of 50 pounds or 25 kilograms, so it's quite movable. And the watering intervals. I usually water my plants about maybe 7 to 10 days, which gives you kind of a, a different kind of freedom than you're used to uh, if you have a large garden. Some things that I thought about when I designed these uh, units each is I knew I needed three of them and they cost about 50 bucks each, so I didn't want to have too much invested in them. I went with 75 liters or 20 gallons because it was, well, what I could get here in Korea very easily. And contrary to what some of I've seen on the internet, the, the five gallon bucket keeps coming up, coming up again. And you'll see people growing hops in these five gallon buckets. And you'll see them in the early season where they get kind of six feet tall. And then you don't typically hear back from them. And I kind of have a theory that the, the hops, they just need more space and they kind of tap out. So I went bigger rather than smaller. And the durability. When, whenever you kind of come up with a vessel, you need to think, is it going to be durable? The UV rays from the sun are brutal. You're looking at three, four, or five years before you maybe you can get consistently high yields from these hops plants. So what will these buckets or what will these troughs look like in that span of time? Hot and cold cycles, during the freeze in the, the winter time, when water is in there, it expands. Will whatever you've chosen to build with, will it be suitable for those conditions? I chose plastic because it was easy to work with, and again, it's what I had on hand, or I could find rather. And the portability, if you're in an apartment, if you're on the move, even if you're not in an apartment and you move cross city or cross state, you could potentially bring these with you. You could use a dolly to lift them if you couldn't lift them yourself. And most importantly, in my situation, would it fit through doorways? And lastly, is it food safe? So this is where I came up with using the Brute Bucket. The sub-irrigated planter in a hole, this is what the schematic looks like. And again, sub, you're watering here. It bypasses the grow medium and it collects in a reservoir down here. This little hole here is an overflow, which means you can never overwater the plant. And here is basically where the wicking starts. This sits in the reservoir of water. You notice the holes in here that allow water to go through and through capillary action it meets the plant roots and they meet somewhere in the middle. Here's one in practice. This looks to be a laundry detergent bucket, maybe five gallons or 19 liters. Here you can see the water pipe, probably one inch PVC. It goes down to the bottom. Here's a false bottom kind of keeps the water reservoir and the grow medium separated. And this thing in the center that sits and occupies both spaces is the probably a potting mix packed real tight and this allows wicking to happen. Here's another application in which it looks like the user here used a perforated drain pipe to act as a false bottom. Growing medium in between and somewhere here would be a PVC pipe allowing you to water while bypassing the medium. If you're looking for different ways to make uh, a sub-irrigated planter or different applications, there's a really good guy on YouTube, 
He goes by the moniker MHP Gardener. He's mostly growing tomatoes or things that are really water intensive. Uh, before I designed this hop planter, I hadn't seen it in action. I hadn't seen it being grown uh, with hops in mind. And after after I've done mine and after it's been successful, I did find one person, a website called Brewbot, B-R-E-W-B-O-T dot C-A, a guy in Canada growing these and uh, really beautiful pictures. And he looks like he has high yields, though he doesn't give you a tutorial. Uh, he went in a different direction. He used the, the square Rubbermaid containers. Okay, so for this build, we're going to be using a brute bucket. About 30 bucks is what I found them for in Korea. And like I mentioned, they're easy to work with. You know, if I, if you didn't want to do this anymore, say if you, you weren't going to be growing hops, uh, you could repurpose these buckets. You could fill this with a non-drilled bung or non-drilled stopper, and you could retain the original functionality of the bucket. However, we're going to build this today. And what I did is I went up about six inches from the bottom of the bucket and using a 22 or 23 millimeter hole cutter, which is a five, let's see here, 15 sixteenths size. I chose this tool size because A, it fits the stopper well, and B, if you drill a kegerator hole, you'll need this exact same tool. So you get two birds, one stone out of that. Anyways, going six inches up with my false bottom and with uh, all that material down below, six inches up gives me two and a half gallons of reservoir. And that's, you know, coming back to that seven to 10 day watering interval. I got plenty of leeway. If you were, you know, if I was to leave town or just kind of forget watering it, I wouldn't come back to a super wilty plant. In Montana during dry season, if I don't water every other day, my leaves will start to suffer and they'll start to wilt. So that's the difference between regular irrigation and having this reservoir underneath. Okay, there's the drilled stopper in there, and that's going to service as your water overflow. I would like to recommend, I don't have a picture of this, but I did put some screen with some wire over it to kind of act as a guard. Because while you want the water to leave the unit, if you uh, over water, you don't want mosquitoes coming in there in that stagnant water and laying eggs. Here's that kind of uh, center thing where that acts as a wick in one of the laundry, in the application where they use the the laundry bucket here uh, looked like they used kind of a yogurt cup. Uh, I used uh, about a six inch planter here that gave me that six inches of clearance and I and I had to kind of think about structural integrity. This is pretty robust so there's no rhyme or reason to where I threw the holes or the size I threw the holes in there. I would just recommend throwing as many holes as you in there as you can to allow water to come in and start that wicking action but not so many that you damage the structural integrity of the planter itself because on top of this you've got basically 60 liters or maybe even more or less grow medium sitting on top of that it gets compacted it's fairly heavy like I mentioned about 50 pounds or 25 kilograms so this does act as a support I threw some rocks down here there's no reason other than I had them and I was trying to get rid of them so don't worry about that here is the six inch planter stood up I'm kind of eyeballing it so where I want to put the overflow and continuation on my false bottom, I'm trying to keep the water reservoir and the wick separate. And these were these kind of mate together. You'll see that. So this is just a kitchen strainer, food safe. It was like about three bucks and easy to work with. And that's why I chose this material. I put a little bit more rock down here to kind of keep that down, keep that from floating. It won't, but just trying to get rid of it. Your water pipe. About this time you want to put in your water pipe and I used one inch PVC. If you're planning on watering your hops with a hose, do make sure you get one with a big enough diameter where you can just kind of stick that hose in it. You don't have to babysit it. Although filling up two and a half gallons won't take that long, but uh, it's just something to think about design wise. Also, when you are when you choose this pipe, this PVC or whatever you may choose, cut it on an angle. Otherwise, if it's flat, and you stick it all the way to the bottom, it can choke off the water flow. It can uh, not allow the water to bypass. But with this point here, you'll never be able to, to pin it to the bottom. Also, version 2.0, if I were to do it again, because I went with perlite as a false bottom uh, material or as a filler, I would put some screen over this. Uh, perlite, when it was dry uh, and it mixes with water, some of it want to come back up here. Not a big deal. Okay, here... The PVC buried to the bottom. I've got the center yogurt cup slash six inch planter packed with 
potting mix. And around here, I've got some perlite. Just kind of, you didn't, you wouldn't have to put this here if you had, say, something that would hold up the rest of the medium. But again, dealing with 60 liters of potting mix, it'll get heavy and it'll fall. Next, I threw some screen down, had it on hand. You know, you don't necessarily have to have a barrier here, but uh, just kind of trying to separate business and pleasure. I've heard of people using cardboard, and while you might think that cardboard disintegrates pretty quickly, and I tend to agree with you, by the time everything has shifted, they've kind of kind of kept its, you know, it's packed down and it, and it won't, you know, won't kind of mix. Here, I've got some t-shirt. Um, again, it was kind of recommended that maybe, maybe this would aid in wicking. Uh, I, probably, probably really unnecessary, but it was cleaning out the closet and just getting rid of it just the same. Here is a mixture, here's kind of a potting mixture of cocoa peat, peat moss, bark, and perlites. This is good for wicking, not too heavy either. So filling up the planter, fill it up, add bucketfuls of soil, kind of shake it around, let it, let it uh, settle as you go. And if you did go with cotton, bring these up. Parallel to all this, I started a hops rhizome in mid-March, and so I was starting it to the side. When you got a rhizome, they're not necessarily, I mean, they're robust, but they're, you know, they don't have a big root system, so their ability to fetch water is less, and even less so in a sub-irrigated planter because, as the name implies, the water will be at the bottom, and they don't have the roots yet to necessarily fetch that water. Putting in the rhizome and it's a soil that it was already in, I filled it up to the to the line and you know as you can see here it's settling. You want to bring the potting mix all the way to the top here and there's a really good reason why I'll tell you in a bit. So at this time you want to give it a good saturation because there is really no moisture in this soil and these hops here they don't have a mature root base yet so they'll be looking for water. You do it once that starts the capillary action and you'll be all good once you fill this with water. So bring that potting mix all the way up to the top and you're gonna add a piece of plastic. Here's clear, um, if you're in a kind of a cooler temperature and you wanna collect solar gain, you might go with black. Another reason to go with black is that it will kind of eliminate the light from the moisture underneath and discourage anything from growing that might ordinarily take an opportunity to grow. Over the drain pipe here, you see I've got screen again, and this is, again, to keep the mosquitoes out of the stagnant water underneath. As this settles, and if you get any seasonal rain, this is a prime location for water to settle because of the plastic, and that's why you wanna fill it all the way up to the brim, and even in the center, go a little bit higher, and that'll kinda of cause a hill effect and it'll sheet water off and you won't have any stagnant water for mosquitoes to hang out. So this is the first year planter. I grabbed these rhizomes in mid-March and this guy took off right away, probably a few weeks in. What did I use for fertilizer? I had some Jax 202020 on hand. I would say about once a month I hit it with fertilizer to the tune of a tablespoon per gallon. I wasn't really meticulous with the notes, but it all turned out quite well. You could use some manure tea or anything else you, you might use in a hydroponic application. So, like I mentioned, got them in mid-March, and this is what they look like in mid-June. Three months later, they went pretty crazy. More pictures of them towards July. And I did get a harvest this, this first year. Flash forward to the next year, 2016. I was really... I. I was really concerned. I didn't know necessarily, you know, I, I, I'm a decent gardener, but I didn't know if, what would the winter cycle be like? Would it, would they get too cold? They don't have the thermal mass of the earth to protect them. Hops do need a period of dormancy before they'll come back. And this was about early April and they came back. As you can see here, there's a definitive settling of the pot, potting mix. So, you know, you will need to add some more there. Uh, this is right before I thinned the herd here. I've heard you want to keep maybe three, four vines, uh, and so that allows all the energy to go into those as opposed to um, these little ones. You know, they're all competing for the same resource. 
So that was early April and this is mid-May here and like as you can see I trimmed them down, I thinned out the herd, I put some black plastic on, kind of keep that light out and maybe encourage a little bit more growth and they're doing phenomenal. Really nice. And up, up and away they go. So I'm looking forward to a really good second year yield.